Are we are we happy to start now? Uh, well, I, I think um, we're now streaming on Facebook, so um, we should possibly um, start our session. We have seven papers um, and we have two hours. So if um, everyone is happy to speak for 10, 15 minutes maximum, and then we will have a break after the first three papers and invite a couple of questions, which you can put in the chat and I'll have a look at them in the chat. Um, or, um, well, I think that's probably the best way because there's quite a few people in the room. And then following that, we'll have the second group of papers and we will do the same again at the end of that. So uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Steffi Hemelreich Donald. I'm, I'm calling in from Liverpool in the UK. Um, and everyone is from all over the place. So I'm not even gonna start trying to introduce everyone to everybody else, but also welcome to everyone on Facebook. I hope the conference is going really well for you all. Our first um, speaker um, is... Hello. Also, can I remind um, everyone? I'm... Sorry. Uh, sorry, I'm supposed to introduce you. Sorry, uh, because oh, of this uh, connection, no, okay. I'm just... <laughs> No, no issue, no issue. It's an honor to introduce uh, Professor Stephanie Donald here. Uh, she is a distinguished professor uh, film and media in College of Art. Uh, prior to her appointment at uh, Lincoln, she was uh, professor and uh, Australian Research Council Future Fellow at UNSCW Sydney, where she also served as academic lead of the Grand Challenge of Refugees and Migrants. She has served as chair of the ARC Humanities and Creative Arts College and deputy chair of the Hong Kong RAE Humanities Panel. Her book, There is No Place Like Home, The Migrant Child in World Cinema, uh, won a Choice Outstanding Academic Title Award in 2018. Her other titles include Childhood and a Nation in World Cinema, Borders and Encounters in 2017, Intercities, uh, Globalization, Mobility and Suspension in Visual Culture 2014, Little Friends, Children's Film and Media Culture in New China 2005. Her current research look, uh, looks at images on migration, detention and childhood. And she is pursuing a project with easing on socialist uh, feelings in Chinese culture. My apologies if I haven't uh, pronounced the name properly. So, ma'am, the uh, now it's on. Uh, it's all your uh, pleasure. I'm to, you can start you now. <laughs> thank you so much and thank you for that really nice introduction. I should also say I'm actually moving to Monash University, Malaysia, in January. So, um, I'm off again. Anyway. Um, I think we should get on with our papers because we have some really exciting papers to listen to now. Um, our first speaker, I'm trying to make sure everyone is here from what I can see, but I can see that Dr. Yatin Kumar Taraya is here. So um, I'll hand over to you and ask you if you could take about um, 10, 15 minutes to introduce your topic on socio-cultural moorings in Humpa Lahiri's Interpreter, Interpreter of Maladies. Um, and we really look forward to hearing your, your thoughts. Over to you. Hello, am I audible, ma'am? You are audible, yes. It's lovely. Up you go. Okay. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Uh, respected chairperson and all the dignitaries. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, title of my paper is uh, Retaining the Roots, Sociocultural Moorings in Humpalari's Interpreting of Maladies. <clears throat> the Indians uh, have great history of traveling the entire world since the classical age for different reasons. Nowadays, the diaspora has changed uh, its, its uh, interpretations and affiliations. The migrants with their nostalgic feelings for the roots and emotional integration through the native culture struggle to be a part of the global culture by preserving their home culture and traditional value system in the different spaces and the different time, far from their uh, motherland. This research paper will examine uh, the regional and cultural traditions, sociocultural moorings narrated by Jhumpa Lahiri in her debut collection of short stories. 
interpreter of maladies. She artistically treated the theme of diaspora to portrait and to interpret the expatriates' efforts to focus on the similarities and differences of the new land and the homeland, and their efforts to stand among the mainstream. The struggle of marginalized characters for retaining the roots and preservation of home culture among the multicultural land constructs the cultural disparity and issues of identity. Uh, as Homi Baba comments, uh, I quote, Multicultural policy entertains and encourages culture diversities while correspondingly containing it. Transparent norm is constituted a norm given by the host society or dominant culture, which says that these other cultures are fine, but we must be able to locate them with our own will. Shoba, <coughs> uh, in the, uh, with her isolated existence, I expected sensibility in the first story of her. Uh, temporary matter, recollecting her memory and the experiences of her homeland while she shares her experiences with Shukumar, her husband. Lahiri artistically narrates the grief of the Shova of her lost will in which she mentioned the rice ceremony, uh, which is celebrated after the few months of newborn baby. The tradition is different for the boy and girl child. Constant hankering for the belonging for their homeland, expatriate community follow the rituals and tradition of their ancestors on the diverse places. As Jumpaleri perfectly and sharply depicts the identification of consciousness of expatriate psyche in the story, it is reflected in the following narration. Uh, I, I quote, their baby would never have a rice ceremony, even though Shobha had already made the guest list and decided on which of her three brothers she was going to ask to feed the child its first uh, test of solid food, a sixth month uh, if it was a boy and a uh, seventh if it was a girl. The desires and aspirations of celebrating rice ceremony of the child in the presence of old relatives and friends. Rice ceremony is a part of a cultural rituals uh, that binds them together with the particular belongings. It clears more her inner emotional integration with her original culture. And when she tells uh, about uh, one of the rice ceremonies in India, which she had attendance once, uh, she said to uh, Shukumar, it's like India, Shoba said, watching him and uh, to make shift. Sometimes the current disappears for hours at a stretch. I once had I once had to attend an entire rice ceremony in the dark. The baby just cried and cried. It must have been so hot. Darkness during the power cut discloses their inner states of mind by empowering their expatriate psyche and provide them a platform to recollect their past, to tackle the problems of the present time and share their grief with each other. Uh, it is a perfect way of retaining the roots. The story articulates certain family crises and domestic issues of expatriates inside the home. Geographical as well as cultural change can be observed in their lifestyle. Their cultural interaction and cultural assimilation of their ancestry construct their original identity and emotional integration in the aligned land. Bhikkhu Parekh rightly observed, record, the diasporic Indian is like the banyan tree. The traditional symbol of the way of life, he spreads out his roots in several soils, drawing nourishment from one when the rest dry up, far from being homeless. He has several homes, and that is the only way he has increasingly come to feel at home in the world. Mrs. Das, in the title story, Interpreter of Maladies, attempts to find the interpretation of her maladies in India to a tourist guide. Perhaps she is expected the solution of her mistake. Even she narrates her situation in her own home, how she feels lonely in different culture in her own home, what she needs from her husband in aligned land, uh, who is there to care for her far from her parents as well as her homeland. She fully disclosed her situation in the courtyard to Mr. Kapasi, a tourist guide. After that, she informed Mr. Kapasi that uh, how she uh, disturbed her life in four walls of house and uh, has a sexual encounter with her husband's friend. She considered it as an unconscious action or happened accidentally when she was nervous and felt lonely and was unable to control herself. However, the matter is common among the host community. Right? Nina's reaction is according to the Indian culture and tradition where extramarital affair is considered as the scene for the married woman. Nina tries to find the solution from the Indian culture or Indian tradition uh, from a uh, Mr. Kapazi, who is tourist guide, when she comes to know about uh, the other job of Mr. Kapazi, she told her all the secrets of her life, which is suppressed in her heart since a long time. She says to Mr. Kapazi, for eight years, I haven't been able to express this to anybody, not to friends, certainly not to Raj. He doesn't even suspect it. 
I feel terrible looking at my children and Raj, our terrible. I have terrible urges, Mr. Kapasi, to throw things away. One day I had the urge to throw everything I own out the window. The television, the children, everything. Don't you think it is unhealthy? Mrs. Sands <coughs> is about agony of unbelonging and uprootedness of a woman who is in the state of cultural exile. The title is very suggestive. It's Mrs. Sands. But what of Mrs. Sands? After reading a story, we realize that it is Mrs. Sands' attempt of retaining the roots of her motherland. It is all about Mrs. Sands' inner state of mind, feelings, emotions, happiness, nostalgic situation, and being expatriate. She migrates to USA because of his marriage with uh, uh, Mr. Sands, who is the professor of mathematics. For her company, they decide to carry an American boy named Elliot, whose mother goes for a job after his school. Elliot lives under the care of her all the day. Now, in the story, we find that Mrs. Sands shares her condition to Elliot. She is bored by the busy lifestyle of the Americans. According to her, everything is there. Uh, there means India. She finds that her neighbors are busy in their respective works and they are not as in India in, India, in her street. Uh, as she uh, tells Elliot about the people who are living nearby her, uh, she says, at home, that is all you have to do. Just raise your voice a bit or express a grief or joy of any kind, and one whole neighborhood and a half of another has come to share the news to help with the arrangements. After the above discussion, Mrs. Sen asked Elliot what happened here if she or anybody does that. Then Elliot answers that my baby, the natives will complain for making the noise. She also tells him about the old habits of the people of Calcutta. Even she refers to India as the home when she is talking about uh, the India. Then she, Mrs. Sen said home, she meant India, not the apartment where she uh, sat chopping vegetables. She tells her about the food of Calcutta and people like to eat fish in Calcutta. Later she informs uh, about the Indian, how in India they are working together at the time of uh, marriage or the family function, as they say. Whenever there is a wedding in the family, she told Elliot one day, or a large celebration of any kind, my mother sends out word uh, in the evening for all the neighborhood women to bring the blades just like this one, and then they sit in a circle on the roof of our building, laughing and gossiping, and slicing 50 kilos of vegetables through the night. Uh, Ava Shukla uh, comments uh, uh, on this uh, issue. Uh, Larry's characters reflect the traces of India through the details of characters that inhabit the complex and complicated world of Indian immigrants in the United States. Her character seems to exist simultaneously in two cultures, the reality of American experience and the memories of, of uh, spheres of Indian traditions. Uh, next to tell of the anthology when, uh, when Mr. Prijada came to dine is about the scholar Mr. Prijada, in which assimilation of migrant so with their home country in the diverse situation and with the reference of the historical as well as political issues is focused. The story is projected at the period of 1971 and the background is Bangladesh during the Civil War. Lahiri artistically portrays the world picture and inside the Indian home in America. A scholar who is away from his family home and homeland for his career, but due to the Civil War in Dhaka, he is living with the depressed mental set. When there was a Civil War in Dhaka, uh, the condition of the home of narrator was quite changed. The, narrat the narrator recollects her memory of this time when uh, she says, most of all, I remember the three of them operating uh, during that time as if they were a single person sharing single meal, single body, single silence and single fear. The last story in the collection, the third, uh, the third and final uh, continent, is about the immigrant who settled in USA after his marriage with the Indian girl, Mark. However, he studied in London for four years. He got the job as a librarian at MIT. So he moves to America after a week of his marriage while her wife has to wait for six weeks because of the visa. They arrive in the year 1969, the same year in which America landed on the moon, uh, which suggests uh, the narrator's progress and living in the well developed the country. However, his wife does not like that. Her son is not aware about their culture, so they decide to go in the following narration. One can understand the importance of the cultural heritage and immigration of their own homeland. As uh, narrator says, she weeps for our son. So we drive it to Cambridge to visit him or bring him home for a weekend so that he can eat rice with us with his hands and speak in Bengali. 
After living 30 years in the country, he feels as his own home and needs of assimilation with uh, his transformation in the adopted land. To consolidate himself about his identity and stability, he says, we can conclude with the statement that Jhumpa Lehri narrated the picture of expatriates' life and lifelike characters like Shobha, Meena, Mrs. Sen, Lila's mother, and Mala. Uh, with their ancestors' sociocultural moodings and constant attempts of retaining the roots in the different uh, spaces and the time. Uh, as uh, uh, we can conclude uh, with the statement that Jumpaleri uh, has uh, given uh, uh, from these characters, uh, Mrs. San, Meena, Shobha, and Mala, uh, we are all the range of uh, uh, women characters, what we find, who are uh, constantly attempt for, the, uh, for retaining the roots. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for keeping to time like that. That was really great. Thank you. Um, thank you I'm going to thank you. I'm sorry to move on so fast, but we must make sure everyone has their time. Um, our next paper is from uh, Ms. Rathore and Mr. Singh. Um, it's on changing dynamics of identity, acculturation and diaspora, a study of Tibetan refugees in India. So I'm not sure whether you're both speaking or one of you is speaking, but whoever it is, now is your time. Okay, I'm just waiting for, um, I can see you're both there. So it's Ms. Shweta and Mr. Jatin Lalit Singh. Are you both, are you both there? If you could unmute and perhaps also show us yourselves on video as well, if you don't mind, that would be lovely. Can you hear me? Hmm. Okay. Um, Ah. Uh. Perhaps. Jatin Lalit. Um, maybe what we should do then is move on to the next paper and then come back to Ms. Rathori and Mr. Singh when they're available, they may have just popped out of the room or something so that we don't lose our time. I think we should probably do that. So is, is Dr. Manish Kamwa here? Manish, I think I can see you. No? Yeah. Uh, so, I'm audible oh. now. Yeah. Yes, you are brilliant. And, uh, I'll pass yeah, on to you. Uh, yeah. uh, like uh, one thing I want to present myself, that means my PPT. So kindly allow me to present my um, PPT. Then I'll. Uh... Yeah. Could the could the conference room allow yeah. Dr. Manish yeah. to share his? Yes, ma'am. Done. Done. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. So um, let's get started. Uh, good evening, uh, respected Chair, Professor Stephanie, Ash Donald, uh, Coordinator, Dr. Firoz Khan, Reporter, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Srija Mukhopadhyay, my co-panelist, academician across the globe, and research scholars. Uh, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to the organizers, the GRFDT, MFA, and CISN for having me in this uh, e-conference. My special thanks to Dr. Mahalingam and my friend, Dr. Sadanand Sahu. I'm Dr. Manish Kanwar, going to present a piece of uh, writing titled uh, Siddhis of uh, Pathar Kuma, a diasporic connect uh, from Africa to Ahmedabad. Before I'm uh, going to the, my presentation, a little bit about the Siddhis. Siddhis is Africans who are living in India and Patharkuma, uh, a small uh, suburban area uh, into the locality of Ahmedabad. This is a two uh, words which um, uh, I want to say, uh, I, I want to give some idea about this thing. And that's what everybody knows about this. So um, uh, somehow I want to go connect uh, to 
uh, my whole presentation to the Africans in India, but a very localized uh, um, uh, way in the Ahmedabad and particularly in Ahmedabad in one place is called Pathar Kuma. So uh, before um, uh, going to the my original presentation, I would like to begin my presentation to show you some photograph of my own archives. Um, and uh, uh, obvious, uh, uh, it was beginning phase of my research. Now I, um, uh, I, I did my research in uh, 2010, and now these did old research needs a, a recent flavor. So that's why I, I went um, uh, localized place like Ahmedabad, Hyderabad, and I am doing my research. So basically, my a broader topic is in Africans in India and African diaspora in India, and. Uh, <clears throat> And this uh, regard, uh, the, I, the, this time I uh, took uh, Ahmedabad for my presentation. So uh, here it is my, uh, here my, uh, some, uh, uh, some research, uh, uh, some uh, research and I'm going to present some uh, photographs of uh, uh, this thing. Uh, okay, so uh, this is the, uh, quickly I uh, move for this. And these are the, um, uh, I think uh, uh, my presentation is visible. Yeah, I can't. I can't see it, but perhaps others can. Um... Okay, one minute. So uh, uh, let's me uh, one minute, ma'am, because these are the technical issues. So give me yeah. uh, give me a few seconds to uh, cover up. Yes. Uh, so um, now, yeah. Yes. I think right. Okay, so uh, these pictures are from my archive. Um, okay, and uh, I'm going fast forward because this is not my original uh, right, uh, today's uh, paper. But these are the Africans who are living right now in India in different parts of India, and in from uh, Maharashtra to Gujarat uh, to Karnataka. And this is the uh, uh, a boy from Dastipur, Gujarat. And this is the, some cities who are living in India. And these are the pictures which gives us a sense uh, uh, Africans in India and their assimilation process. This is the um, uh, this is the drum and Siddhi man, uh, man using this drum and uh, and they are residing in Gujarat, uh, Dastipura. And these cities are from Hyderabad. And so these are the collection from my old collection, which I. Uh, um, uh, which I did in 2010. Uh, so, but this is important to start uh, to begin my uh, to begin my paper uh, here. So these are the things. Uh, so these with striking African features, and these all are Afro Indians. The citizenship is in Indian Afro Indians now living from thousand years in uh, uh, since 1000 AD since uh, since 1000 AD in India. So these are the uh, uh, my uh, first uh, set of. Uh, uh, pictures now uh, i am into the uh, i'm into the my uh, presentation uh, the this time presentation this is my uh, presentation okay and the topic as uh, as everybody knows about my topic is cities uh, of pathar kuma are diasporic connect from africa to ahmedabad and uh, for this uh, uh, the framework of my study, uh, according to recent uh, uh, census, the uh, population of cities in India is approximately 60,000. The cities, uh, Indians of African descent are a small um, uh, minority in Gujarat, probably around 10 to 12,000 population lived in various parts of Gujarat in which 500 cities are in Ahmedabad. The Africans presence in India, particularly in Ahmedabad and uh, their culture and social assimilation provides the primary framework of my this uh, uh, this paper or this presentation okay and for the objective of my paper to uh, advocate the concept that indian culture has uh, been endured and enriched by the african culture and vice versa to discuss the african diaspora played an uh, pivotal role in india and the thirdly to discuss the contemporary positions of cities at the uh, pathar kuwa that means ahmedabad so uh, let's get started with the layout and content uh, uh, this is some of the recent literature historical background of African diaspora in India, journey from Africa to Gujarat, ports, uh, trade and slaves, Gujarat kingdoms and the rise of cities and uh, particularly cities in Ahmedabad. Okay, and now uh, this is my idea and my uh, conclusion.
person. Okay. Um, regarding the literature, these are the handful of milestone paper or a study. Like in October 2021, I'm writing this paper. Um, uh, we are having uh, three good uh, research paper in the South Asian History and Culture um, uh, um, uh, Journal of South Asian History and Culture, and uh, by Bibi Kohan, Jesu Silva, Jesuria, and K. S. Khader. And apart from this, uh, Purnima Bhatt, Robin Kenneth, and uh, uh, Edward A. Elpris gives a very good insight about this these topics, but not particularly the Hyderabad. And another is the Santik Sadik Ali, RSS Shohan, uh, M. N. Pearson also gives a good idea about. Um, uh, about this, uh, uh, this particular Africans in India or African diaspora in India. So uh, 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 let's begin with the historical background of African diaspora in India. It's very interesting uh, because uh, uh, through the ages, number of Africans uh, uh, are in India. They considered uh, this country of their own and uh, rose to become rulers, generals, administrators, slave and architects. Their involvement in the court politics was uh, very important and very important. Um, like uh, uh, strengthened so high rose to the power there uh, there have been uh, numerous instances where they uh, have emerged as a kingmaker as well so from the uh, rulers general from the generals administrators they become the kingmakers also in the janjira and sachin kingdom they had uh, obvious they become kingmaker uh, as uh, already i mentioned and in the uh, in the uh, uh, in india the dispersal of africans are many provinces uh, like uh, Bengal, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Daman and Diu, Goa, Andhra Pradesh. But in Gujarat, Karnataka and Maharashtra, their concentration are uh, very much there. They, they lived in the different parts, different ideas. And the obvious several Africans played an important role in the different dynasties, like uh, um, uh, everybody knows about the Malik Ambar, Malik Sarwar. And the first person who, um, who came to uh, the historical record is uh, Yakut, the courtier of the Rajya Sultan. Um, Rajya Sultan courtiers Yakut, and he was an African uh, Abyssinian, so called Abyssinian, who came to uh, Raja Sultan's uh, uh, court and uh, become a very important part and parcel of uh, Raja Sultan army. Okay, and uh, now uh, we move towards uh, from um, uh, from that uh, 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 all over India perspective to the Af to the Gujarat. How they came to Gujarat, uh, um, the ports, the trade, the slaves. So. Obvious pre colonial Gujarat under Muslim uh, domination, at least its coastal urban centers, rather cosmopolitan Arab traders settled in India, and as well as Gujarati merchants settled in the East Africa. So, East Africa and the west part of India are very good, uh, a very interesting um, uh, intermingle between the um, uh, East Africa and the western part of India. Since the 13th century and after the rise of Muslim power, Gujarat large and small ports uh, such like Surat, Baruch, Kambe, in the the East and the Kush area uh, were in, increasingly engaged in overseas trading relationship with the similar ports along with the country bordering the shore of the Indian Ocean. So I, here I want to portray that uh, we had a very good, a very interesting, very assimilating trade process between the uh, eastern part of uh, Africa and the western part of India. And in the mid 16th century, after the Portuguese has conquered Goa, they maintained a, a, a regiment uh, at Diu, a port on the shore of the Prince of Saurashtra consisting 600 Africans as a soldiers. So uh, Africans are coming to India in 18th century, in 19th century, and even uh, uh, even uh, when the uh, uh, British campaign against the Arabs, the uh, the numbers were less, but uh, continuous, the Africans came to India in the Gujarat port. At this point, they were working as a local uh, royal courts or by uh, rich trade, like the other domestic servant of low status relatively uh, noble cities fused themselves in elite class of Muslim in the past rulers. So this is the story of um, of how they came to India and how they came to uh, Gujarat itself. Now, um, now the their prominence. Uh, one prominent feature of the decline declining year of the Gujarat kingdom was the rise of power and influence of several noble hubs's origin who played no significant part in the civil uh, uh, movement and civil strife of the time. Uh, among these, uh, 
uh, we may mention uh, we may mention the Amir who enjoyed the title of uh, um, Ulu Khan, Iktiar Ul Malik, uh, Jujhar Khan, and the three most important cities in uh, Gujarat: uh, Dilawar Khan, Yakut Khan Hapsi, and uh, Yakut San Muhammad. Uh, in 1561-62, it is reported that there were 5,000 African slaves in Ahmedabad. Um, 5,000 African slaves in Ahmedabad, the capital of the uh, Sultan, and 1,500 is another major city, Baroda. So here, we mentioned 1,561 to 62, there were the 5,000 African slaves in uh, Ahmedabad. Now I'm coming to the Ahmedabad, okay? Uh, and in 1,517, Akbar conquered Gujarat and uh, and itself conquering, after the conquering Gujarat, he may, uh, uh, like, uh, it um, assimilate some Africans in their their uh, army also. So uh, these are whole picture about the uh, firstly Africans in India, Africans in Gujarat. Now I'm going to talk about the uh, Ahmedabad because uh, in 1561 and 1562 there were the 5,000 African slaves in Ahmedabad and um, and. Uh, uh, and what happened to them? Right now, only 500 uh, people living in the uh, Ahmedabad, so on the uh, the suburban area of um, uh, of Patharkua and other parts of uh, other parts of uh, Ahmedabad. So um, uh, I may go to some pictures again, recent pictures. This is the Af uh, African cities leader in the Patharkua. This is the January, December, January 1920s picture. And I went there and interviewed so many Africans who right now lived. Uh, there and uh, intermingle and then still uh, uh, the prominent features like um, uh, Africans, but they are the uh, uh, Afro Indians who are living in India from the last uh, um, last uh, five to six hundred years in uh, in uh, no doubt in the very um, uh, marginalized manner. I will discuss about this uh, later on. So and this is the area where they are living. This is the picture aerial picture uh, Google map Patharkua Kalupur and Siddhi, uh, Siddhi Said Mosque and Mosque. And these are the uh, Sabarmati River, uh, the old town the called, the old town is uh, where the Patharkua is right now situated. And this is the um, uh, view. And this is the Siddhi uh, Said Mosque, the very prominent and IIT Ahmedabad emblem, um, like um, uh, accepted the Jali idea of uh, Siddhi Said Mosque. So these are the pictures which is recent. I went there, I interviewed so many um, Siddhis there. And and uh, so, uh, so what is the history of Ahmedabad? What is the uh, what is the history of uh, cities in Ahmedabad? Okay, so uh, yes, uh, give me a second. So right now. Uh, I'm talking about the cities in Ahmedabad, obvious historic city uh, established in 1411 by the noble Ahmad Shah, who has rebelled against the overlords in Delhi. The new rulers of Gujarat, keen to establish their superiority in the uh, material realm, had undertaken a, a program of building activities of their new capital, Ahmedabad. Once 5,000 to 500 cities are a story of this uh, city. Uh, 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 once 500 to now, 500 uh, cities, the story of this city, this is the uh, very important. And uh, Patharkua, Kalupur, Sarkhej, Gomtipur, or uh, uh, Sardar, uh, Sardam Nagar, they are the area uh, we find cities in Ahmedabad. Patharkua is largely amongst all. There are 30 clusters of the household. And uh, uh, cities, Ahmedabad is aware that cities have been in the city for a very long time. They say six to um, 700 years. They say that all the cities now, Patharkua, have came from the various parts of the Gujarat. Everyone staying uh, here has come from outside, unlike Siddhis of uh, Saurashtra who speak Gujarati as uh, their mother tongue. Siddhis in Patharkua, uh, they speak Hindi in their uh, uh, homes, apart from Baba Gore. Baba Gore, that was the spiritual guru, and their ancestors who came to the Gujarat around 14, they presumed they, they came, uh, he came to the Gujarat around 14th century AD. Apart from the Baba Gore Chila, Dargah of uh, Siddhi, Sultan, who was an army chief, Dargah of uh, Siddi Basir, uh, Siddi Sayyid uh, Masjid, are important historical place. Uh, Siddi Sayyid was uh, responsible for building this mosque in Ahmedabad, which is world famous, uh, um, obvious. Uh, art and uh, art form and uh, window screens or jali uh, these are the important um, 
parts in a medieval uh, ahmedabad there was 12 gates or entry point to the city built by ahmed shah and it was sidi who guarded the entire city or entrance to make certain certain that the goddess of lakshmi goddess of wealth lakshmi won't abandon the city just like the city of delhi we are having 13 gates like azmeri gate kashmiri gate uh, delhi gate uh, merit gate calcutta gate in ahmedabad city also there were the 12 gates and that gate guarded by the uh, africans uh, city and the gates are tripolia gate delhi gate istodia gate and daryapur gate as the re recent research i already mentioned about this recent research shows that the siddhis of gujarat and their oral narratives to establish a genealogy a uh, counter history by virtue of which space is imagined as a way of belonging and uh, uh, claiming cultural citizenship um, and another i interacted one uh, siddhi uh, uh, babu bhai siddhi and he told me the same story about the uh, about the lakshmi about the uh, about the wealth and uh, uh, the tale functions a moral fable about the syncretic uh, harmony between the hindus and uh, muslims in the war, uh, in the um, uh, worship and in uh, in also the syncretic culture of hindu and uh, muslim through the architecture and um, uh, mosque today uh, what happened about the mosque uh, today yes this mosque is today's globally uh, recognized uh, um, form but uh, people are not, not aware that this uh, these uh, monuments or basically this siddhi sayed uh, dargah or uh, mosque um, uh, built by a uh, siddhis uh, africans who are living in uh, india and they uh, they part and parcel of the um, uh, of the sultan's army and after the sultan after the decline of gujarat kingdom they uh, uh, they played a very significant uh, role to build this uh, this ahmedabad city so um, uh, uh, I we just have um, just have really just one minute left. Okay, okay, ma'am. Yes, yes. I'm I'm coming to my uh, conclusion part. So, when I interacted to the these people because I. Uh, Uh, i developed a paper and um in the that paper i'm uh, going to include each and everything about the interview uh, how many interview i have i've took but in the conclusion um, uh, regarding all those interviews uh, in conclusion siddhis of ahmedabad are few in numbers are and uh, perceived as entirely different individual uh, compared to the other siddhis population of different parts of gujarat recently i visited and interviewed siddhis this community of patthar kuma people of this community in the region feel that they are still not in the part of main stream uh, society even after almost 500 years of settlement in india they went to get edu uh, they want to get education uh, and work especially work for female they are in the demand of uh, uh, scheduled caste status so they can avail benefits of the some government uh, reservation and government jobs so these are the part of uh, composite culture of ahmedabad but as a researcher i feel that a sultan of medieval india placed them in army sports and in other such areas currently also they should be placed in such position rather than being connected with the fields of only music and uh, uh, and dance the time has come that we involved in the development and ground zero not through the research not through the intellectual discourse but we go and work together to uh, to uh, to build a harmony uh, in the community of indians uh, uh, indo africans uh, that means indian uh, diaspora uh, african diaspora in india thank you very much for giving me this time okay thank you thank you so much and what a very positive ending to your talk thank you Um, we're going to now go back and just see whether um, Ms. Shweta Lathore and Mr. Jatin Light Singh are available. Are you available? If so, just let us know. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You are. That's This is lovely. Jatin. Yes. Okay. Brilliant. So um, I'll let you um, decide between you how you're going to present this. You've got again ten fifteen minutes. Um, I believe you're talking on changing dynamics of identity, acculturation, and diaspora: a study of Tibetan refugees in India. So over yes, to you. Thank you very much. 
Good evening to all respected chairperson and other dignitaries in the conference room. Uh, this is Jatin Lalit, a law student on behalf of both the authors will be presenting the paper titled Changing Dynamics of Identity, Acculturation and Diaspora, a Study of Tibetan Refugees in India. Uh, before uh, going into the paper, I would like to uh, share the screen and share the PPT with, uh, with the room. Um, could the conference room give? Yes, lovely. Thank you. Not me. <laughs> so the the paper primarily deals with. So the paper primarily deals with the status of Tibetan refugees living in India. The, the focus and the objective of the study is to examine the acculturation process of Tibetan refugees who are living uh, in the most diverse country of this world called India. The paper also seeks to examine the uh, meaning uh, individuals accredited to their culture, uh, the way they perceive and describe their own cultural identity, and the role of culture and the role that the culture plays there in their day-to-day -day lives as they develop themselves in this dynamic present era of globalization. In these 10 to 15 minutes in my hand, I will be going through, through the highlights of the paper under the heads of background of the paper, introduction, then I'll come to the understanding discourses within Tibetan diaspora, then to changing dimension of acculturation, Tibetan refugees and identity, identity crisis. And in the end, I will share the minor field study that both the authors did in the Aruna Nagar uh, in New Delhi, where the Tibetans are currently residing in India. The aim of this paper is to present discourses within Tibetan diaspora and how the Tibetans relates to this, as well as the, how they create their own culture in this diverse background. Uh, without a national identity or a country to call home in order to survive, Tibetans had to acculturate and assimilate into the mainstream Indian culture. The paper delves to understand how acculturation affects Tibetan refugees living in India. The paper is the result of minor field study on Tibetan refugees residing in India. In the in the in this present slide, we can see uh, I am the author that is interviewing the residents uh, from the Arunanagar colony, which is also known as Majnuka Tila. And uh, on the left hand side, there is a health clinic board, which is uh, uh, which is for the health related issues of Tibetan refugees living in Arunanagar. Coming to the introduction, this paper also seeks to examine the meaning individuals accredited to their culture and the, the way they perceive and describe their own cultural identity and the role of culture plays in their day-to-day -day lives as they develop themselves in this dynamic present era. Data used in this study was gathered through personal interview with 70 Tibetan men and women who claimed refugee status living in refugee settlement land in Majnu Katila, New Delhi. I will explain the findings of the interview in the later slides. The interview served as a practical tool to present the actual situation of different dynamics of refugees residing in Majnu Katila. It is true that Tibet is briefly lost. However, the diaspora is still alive. The Tibetans have always been identified as people who have preached peace and tranquility. Since 1959, the reason for unsettlement of Tibetan government in exile is a question of preservation of the Tibetan culture and legacy. The cultural identity of the Tibetans are defined by their language, their Buddhist teaching, rituals, etc. Coming to the uh, Tibetans in uh, what is their status and what is uh, the overview of Tibetans in India. Now one has to see that what is the status of Tibetans in India, how they arrive in India and how they are living in India. As India is not a signatory to the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees, which is considered as the primary instrument establishing international norms for the treatment of refugees. As a result, India's refugee policies and practices remain outside of the office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. In short, Tibetans are the only official refugee groups the Indian government has recognized and are legally permitted to reside in India. Also, Tibetan refugees have enjoyed preferential treatment from the Indian government, not according to other refugees in India. For example, India offers Tibetan relative autonomy over public education with some public support system. Tibetans and their leaders continue to voice gratitude for the Indian hospitality. 
Although Tibetans were designated as, as foreigners and barred from owning land, the Indian government has donated land for settlements and invited others to live in more remote Himalayan regions and former British Himalayan hill stations like Dharamshala, Maklod Ganj, where the Dalai Lama ultimately settled in the mid-1960s. The hospitality India has shown towards Tibetan refugees has historical, ideological and strategic components. Coming to uh, the main part of the paper where we discuss about Tibetan refugees and acculturation. There is no doubt that acculturation remains a topic of interest for many researchers and human service professionals. Understanding acculturation helps ident identify not only the culture and person, but has also specific issues affecting the minority community. However, before explaining about Tibetan refugees and acculturation, we have to understand what acculturation means. According to Merriam-Webster dictionary, the first known use of term acculturation was in 1880 and is defined as cultural modification of an individual group or people by adapting or to borrowing traits from another culture. In simpler terms, acculturation is the process of social, psychological and cultural change that stems from blending among other cultures. Acculturation often results in change in changes to culture, custom, religious practices, diet, healthcare, and other social institutions. Tibetan refugees is one of the group which has adapted to the new host culture and at the same time preserving their home identity, culture, and communication practices. Tibet, Tibetan diaspora has done an incredible job in carrying on the culture and tradition legacy, even being in exile. And it is the most complementary character, characteristic of the group. There are people who are currently residing in a totally new environment which is distant from their land of origin. Now coming to the changing dimension of acculturation, community network and personality of all refugee groups in a host nation are, be as it may, open-ended open -ended phenomena that is subjected to constant change as referenced previously. Majority of young Tibetans living in India belonging to the age group of 20 to 30 years have completed their education in India. Place of education has a very important role in building up the cultural values as a person and as a result, their cultural values and views are influenced with the culture and environment in India. Tibetan refugees have acknowledged the role of education, which has helped them in carrying on the Tibetan language and traditions. Tibetan refugees in India can be said to be one of the most successful refugee groups who have maintained their cultural and tradition till date. Though it can be easily observed that Tibetan have observed and inculcated some of the culture, cultures, languages, words, practices that is alien to them in context of Indian culture. The Tibetan have always promoted teaching in Tibetan language, all the Buddhist texts, the teaching in monasteries, etc., and have always been in their own language. However, acculturation have made them include English and Hindi in their vocabulary as well. Now, coming to the minor field study, which both the authors did, uh, the objective was in order to get practical insights of the lives and livelihood of Tibetan refugees and to examine the acculturation process of the of Tibetan refugees who are living in who are living in the most diverse country of this world. It is pertinent to mention here that culture plays an important role in their day-to-day -day lives as it helps in the development in this dynamic times of globalization. A survey along with an interview was done by both the authors. Coming to the uh, settlement overview, the location chosen for survey was Majnuka Tila, which is in New Aruna Nagar, Delhi. Most inhabitants of Majnuka Tila left Tibet in 1959-1960 when Dalai Lama also went into exile to Dharamshala. The then Prime Minister of India, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, granted asylum and rehabilitated them in refugee camps across the length and breadth of the country. Eventually, the Tibetan colony developed on the bank river Yamuna, North Delhi, on National Highway 9. Majnuka Tila covering an area of 69,627 square meters. Additional plot was also granted in 1981 for the rehabilitation of those affected by widening of the National Highway. In 2004, a uh, national uh, capital uh, territory of Delhi named the colony as New Arunanagar and it was subsequently registered as New Arunanagar Welfare Association. The colony was self sustaining, having a school to health clinic. Uh, and a place of worship. Both the authors surveyed the whole area and questioned total 70, 51 Tibetan refugees. Uh, this, this is the uh, slide which has the questionnaire that we uh, went to uh, and based our surveys on. 
coming to the findings of our uh, minor field study as per our visit to majnu katila the refugee area of for tibetan refugees project we first came to know that the area is also famous with the word monastery as the people working there send their children to hostels for studies and self development which is known as monasteries the area is full of tibet people with their businesses someone is running a shop and someone is running a restaurant which critically in indicates that there is no lack of work every single person has access to his or her bread and butter bread and butter and to the just bread and butter and no lack of employ employment opportunities questionnaire session with tibetan refugees was quite an interesting closer to the status of tibetan refugees the survey questionnaire and answer uh, and question answer session with tibetan refugees settled at majnu katila was quite an interesting closer to the status of tibetan refugees in india and it led to a better understanding of the tradition culture and the concept of acculturation after having a question answer session with them that the tibetan refugees are quite down to earth and humble people who do not really open to new people however the con conversation with only few of them proved quite fruitful for the for the purpose of our people the tibetan refugees uh, they maintain their tradition by selling tibetan food cuisine traditional ornaments and other accessories of prayer and worship as well they they maintain their tradition by selling food cuisine uh, and uh, some of them even run small sweater stalls and maintain their livelihood here majnu katila had become a tourist spot and led to a better development and better income for the uh, better income for the tibetan refugees in that area there is less inequality and stereotypical treatment by the outs outsider and more acceptance of marriage outside the community the tibetan have built up the temples monasteries and stupas at the places where they settle the problem that we face during the minor field study is when we are dealing with an ethnic population it is anthropographic studies and participant observation is the best way to extract information it was to cover whole area for analysis and survey the time was less to interact because everyone was reaching out to cover the maximum target to let people interact with us we had to spend more time with them people with casual nature were needed to Uh, to so that they easily get into the comfort zones and led it to a fruitful survey an anthropology of an anthropographic analysis would serve the purpose well these are the graphical representation of the questionnaire session uh, 40% of the people living in the area they said that they have they haven't got any job opportunities and livelihood security 32% of people feel that they haven't they have got no freedom to celebrate festival and in their tradition when it comes to the higher education opportunities 69% of them feel that there are education opportunities while 31% doesn't feel so when it comes to marriage and women dependency there was a diverse uh, answer from them 38 they that they can marry outside the community and when it comes to women's depend women dependency 68% claim to be the dependent women on their on their husband or father while 32% were independent women when the question of permanent and proper settlement came 39% were satisfied with what indian government is doing while 61% were not coming to the conclusion part the most striking characteristic of tibetan communities outside of tibet has been their ability to preserve and maintain a distinct culture identity despite spending many years in exile tibetan refugee diasporas have been able to carry on a cultural legacy in exile despite physical detachment from and limited contact with their homeland and indeed the epicenter of their spiritual and cultural world the tibetan refugees living in the mainstream indian culture do not have a particular identity that they can own or they do have a country with which they can relate themselves the tibetan refugees have survived and built their sources of livelihood in india they have passed on to their tradition and culture to the next generation they have made monasteries schools buddhism libraries and other resource center in order to keep up their tibetan individuality alive and with the aim to keep the people of their community united the relative success in resisting assimilation into the host society has been attributed to their refugee status which symbolizes continued allegiance to tibet cultural preservation is a paramount concern in the lives of almost all of the tibetan refugees thank you
Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to move straight on to the next. Um, I think we need to stop sharing your screen if that's possible. Beautiful, thank you. Um, yes, I just apologize everyone. We're gonna move straight on without questions because I'm looking at the time and I know we have four more present presentations, so it's quite tight. So hopefully there'll be time at the end for questions. If not, hopefully people can email each other. Um, the next, so sorry, so we're going to move on to the next speaker, who is Dr. Monica Bishranjan. And are you there, Dr. Ranjan? Just check you are there. Um, just having a look around everybody's names. I can't see whether Dr. Ranjan is there, Ranjan is there or not. Um, it's the talk on uh, internet-based matchmaking in the Indian diaspora. So could you just make yourself known if you're here? Right. Okay, I, I can't see whether Dr. Ranjan is here. So we'll move on. And then if she is here, we can come back to her. So now I'd like to call on Ms. Ratna Bharati. Um, who is speaking on the transmission of cultural codes through language. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, absolutely. Right. Lovely. Thank you so much. I'll so, pass to you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Ratna and I'm going to speak about transmission of cultural codes through language. Study of... Um, right. Can you see me now? Right? Okay. So, study of Gujarati diaspora in Portugal, in Lisbon, Portugal. Claire Cram said, and I quote, through all its verbal and non-verbal aspects, language embodies cultural reality. Migration entails a combination of several socio-cultural and economic situations that enmesh to form a migrant's identity. In, a in an attempt to reconnect to one's roots, to develop a sense of diasporic self, the struggles of identity, location of home, and a sense of need to belong surfaces. One mode of staying connected with the homeland is through language. Diaspora communities are linked by language, which involves the communications vehicle in its triple function, information or messaging, network and transnational or identity negotiation. The research looks into the formation of the concept of India and Indianness among the youngest generation between the ages of three to 15 of Gujarati diaspora in Lisbon, Portugal through the learning of Gujarati language. The process of creating, maintaining and accepting the Indian identity involves the intertwining of the ideas of kinship, home, citizenship and religion, which are layered in the transmission of cultural codes like language, which in turn affect the impression of identity in diaspora. Through in-depth interviews of teachers, students, and their parents, the study conducted in the Gujarati language classes held at Radha Krishna Temple, Comunidade Hindu de Portugal, that is Hindu community of Portugal in Lumia, Lisbon, Portugal, elaborates the subtlety of this transfer and embodiment of cultural codes among the members of Gujarati diaspora between the ages of three to 15. The child respondents of the study are Gujaratis and are all citizens of Portugal. Most of them have not visited India, the teachers are born in Kenya and Mozambique, whose Indian origins are Povandar and the other from DU, Gujarat, India, respectively. The aim of Gujarati classes is to recreate a social space to engage with perceived homeland. With simple rules like Gujarati Bolo Klasma, that is speak Gujarati in the class, the Gujarati classes help bring India into the daily lives of students. The routine of the class leads to talking and exploring about India on a regular basis. Their conversations range from weather to way of living, cause children to develop a sense of belonging gradually. The Gujarati language classes highlight the attempt of the Indian diaspora on a whole to retain, reclaim and reconnect with the Indian identity while retaining their Portuguese culture and heritage that they are born into. The paper outlines how the diasporic self develops and sustains itself as an amalgamation of home and hostland through the transmission of cultural codes through language among the youngest generation of Gujarati diaspora. And to further imply that transmission of cultural codes through language is not just a means of survival, but a process that helps in making of the diasporic self by blurring of territorial boundaries through imagination. The paper outlines how the diasporic self develops and sustains itself 
through the transmission of cultural codes. Apart from the introduction, background, and methods, the paper contains four sections, transmission of cultural codes through language, language and perceived cultural identity, home and sense of belonging, and the last section is becoming Indian through Gujarati language, understanding how language creates citizens in transit and simultaneous transnational existence. The sections delineate in detail how the transmission of cultural code occurs through Gujarati language. So we begin with the concepts of trans diaspora, transnationalism, home and identity. The term diaspora finds its roots in Greek language and is based on a translation of the Hebrew word galut based on spiro, that is to sow, and the predisposition dia over in ancient Greece, the word referred to migration and colonization. In Hebrew, the term initially referred to the settling of colonies of Jews outside Palestine after Babylonian exile, and has assumed a more general connotations of people settled away from their ancestral homelands. The members of the diaspora are known to remain con connected with their homeland through several means, virtual and physical. Through the expansion of connectivity in the world, a theoretical approach that analyzes the behavior and networks that are maintained globally by the migrants is transnationalism. Transnationalism can be defined as a process of migrants remaining strongly connected to their homelands, even as they become incorporated into their hostlands. Migrants use a variety of transnational political, religious, and civic arenas to forge a social relationship, earn their livelihoods, and exercise their rights as cross borders. Nasta said, and I quote, home, it has been said, is not where one belongs to, but where one starts from. Thereby, home as a construct can be understood in several different per perceptions, imagined, constructed, perceptive, performative, and in essence, not just a geographical entity or merely a landscape. These variations in understanding of home primarily occur due to different understandings of people, especially those who migrate from one place to another. Although the process of migration might occur due to various reasons, the continual need to belong in terms of being accepted and to feel at home are common, especially among the members of Gujarati diaspora, whose land of origin, land of birth, and land of settlement are not the same. The understanding of home also lies in the means of self-perception. Wadwek thereby aptly questions if transnationalism and transnational identity serve as a mode of resistance or in contrast, a method to blend in. It can only be said that the development of transnational identity can be a means for the diaspora to locate self with respect to the environment that they inhabit. The diaspora may not, in exact terms, belong to more than one country in terms of citizenship territory, but the diaspora as a community attempts to create a sense of belonging that transcends various ca categories such as nationality, religion, citizenship, while being rooted in the culture of its origin. Coming to background, the Gujarati community in Lisbon, Portugal is mostly inhabited by people who travel from Diu, Gujarat, India to Mozambique, Africa, and later to Portugal, following its independence in 1974. The community networks are equally and strongly maintained despite the twice migration, which created a significant difference in perception of Indian identity among the migrants. Although affluent Gujarati traders had centuries old history of international trade, others were driven by their more immediate needs. During the 1860s, the rural families uh, in Surat, that is Gujarat, profited from their short-lived cotton boom, resulting from southern states stopping cotton production. However, the boom ended and the many families were destitute. In several African countries following independence, Indians were discriminated against in jobs, expelled, repatriated, or felt insecure. The Hindu community in Portugal began developing in 1975. The population of Indian origin in Portugal can be divided into three distinct groups. The majority comes from Gujarat and includes Hindus and Muslims, Christians, who are mainly from Goa, and the Sikhs came from Punjab. Before migrating to Portugal, Portuguese Gujarati families lived mostly in Mozambique, though this migration from India occurred in different waves, that is the early 20th century and after the Second World War. Some of these Gujarati families came from Diu as well as Goa and Daman under the Portuguese colonial rule until 1961. Methods. This study draws on fieldwork conducted in Gujarati classes organized at Radha Krishna Temple, uh, Lumiar in Lisbon, Portugal in 2015. The Gujarati classes at the temple have been continuing. The Radha Krishna Temple was founded in the year 1998 and was said to be groomed as a center for various sociocultural, educational, and religious activities. Even before the construction of temple process completed, Gujarati classes were organized in the premises. Gujarati classes were held in a few schools in Lisbon on Saturdays. 
The Radha Krishna Temple website mentions Gujarati classes functioning from 2010 to present date. However, the Gujarati classes were organized at the social center located in the temple as a part of other scheduled welfare activities, even before the temple was fully built. Therefore, people identify the Gujarati classes as a social activity and not necessarily a religious activity. So the major focus was to interview people and understand their opinions related to India and Indianness. The research took the course of everyday conversation. All interviews have been recorded after gaining consent from the research participant. Since most students in the class were minors, they were interviewed in presence of their teachers and the parents were interviewed in detail while dropping or picking up their children from the Gujarati class. Apart from the semi-structured interviews, participant observation during teacher-student interaction and group discussions between parents and teachers were used to understand how language learning helped the students. Um, for instance, all students are taken out for a mini picnic once a week where they're asked to bring different kinds of Indian snacks from home to share with each other. Sometimes all students visit the canteen located inside the temple establishment after a test or class to have a good time. These efforts are meant to forge a better bonds with each other and not limit interaction only to class. 26 people were interviewed, including parents of 12 students. 12 students were interviewed and two teachers present at the Gujarati class. One of all the research uh, participants was a Portuguese lady who has, uh, who has married an Indian. There are a total of 17 students in the class. However, students aged between three to eight were not allowed to be a part of uh, interviews and were only allowed to be a part of participant observation. Now coming to the first section that is transmission of cultural codes through language. The learning of Gujarati language is not constrained to mere reading and writing. The aim of the Gujarati classes is to be able to shape the thinking and understanding of students to imagine India. The Gujarati classes are conducted at the temple premises every on every Saturday from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. The academic sessions are held from September to June every year. Students are divided into two groups, that is primary and secondary. One group learns Gujarati alphabets, um, usually children be aged between three to eight. And the other group is taught a combination of complex activities. Um, which include names of days, months in the form of songs, daily prayer in Gujarati. It must be mentioned that daily prayer is optional to every student. Students about the age of 15 are not accepted. Subjects taught include maths, riddles, stories, festivals. Language has a sense of symbolic purpose in the sense, the learning of language in inculcates a sense of belonging to its origins and community. Two teachers, uh, teacher one, both are females and both of them are paid for commute. They choose to take no salary for this because they primarily treat it as service to their community and to others as well. Now, coming to the next section, language and perceived cultural reality, an extremely important aspect of learning and teaching Gujarati to younger generation members of Gujarati diaspora in Lisbon is to be able to maintain the intergenerational connect. A respondent, a mother, a lady 40 years old, mother of 11 year old boy who's half Gujarati and half Portuguese, who takes the Gujarati classes, Ted told me that his grandfather wants to tell him so many stories, but he is not able to understand any because he can't speak Gujarati. So this, this, this situation creates distance as this relation is entirely dependent on communication. When I spoke to the child, the, the 11 year old boy who says, Gujarati is difficult. I've been coming to the class for a few years now. If they did not explain Gujarati in Portuguese, I would not have understood much. But now I'm learning because my dadaji continues to understand my Gujarati. So we can see that students are taking one small step in establishing relations with their family members. The Gujarati language serves as a major catalyst in ensuring the continuation of familiar relations. As known, the familiar network is the basis for transnational activities and communication is a major factor in building the ties. Though the children are born in Lisbon are naturalized citizens of Portugal and can converse in Portuguese, the older members in the Gujarati community and family are not able to do so. This in fact is in direct contradiction with the immediate reality of children's surroundings where Portuguese is the language of everyday life. The moment students realize that certain family members are not familiar with Portuguese, but with Gujarati, it establishes a thought that Gujarati is not just an Indian language, but it is their own language as their family members speak it. We come to the third and the second last section, which is the home and sense of belonging. 
The context of displacement provides a point of encounter between an authority and an alien. Self-fashioning is at once the mental adjustment to combat the pangs of physical dislocation and at the same time is the physical adjustment to allay the sense of alienation and rootlessness. I quoted Shankar Saha. In, in Gujarati language classes, the respondents themselves recorded between the position of self and the other. This primarily happened at the location of self seemed to be problematic. The love for surroundings juxtaposed with the love for origins. The second generation respondents were well aware that their parents were from Mozambique, Africa. The identity location also heavily depends on the public and private sp spaces which the members of diaspora inhabit. The transmission of cultural codes is also a mechanism of how diaspora engages with the outer world, that is the immediate surroundings. As a result, the identity cannot be merely divided into self and the other. There are deeper layers formed which where both consequently intertwine, sometimes only for an instance, sometimes for longer, sometimes for, for a certain period. Ethnic identity is a complex phenomenon and can only be understood if it is viewed as a multifaceted selective process rather than a unidimensional and static characteristic. The Gujarati classes cultivate a spirit of being Indian systematically. By explaining the diversity present in India, the Gujarati classes explain to students the essence of Indian values lies in accepting and embracing of differences. This cultivation occurs through transmission of cultural codes. Now my final section, becoming Indian through Gujarati language, understanding how language creates citizens in transit and simultaneous transnational existence. Transnationalism is a process by which migrants through their daily life activities and social, economic and political relations create social fields that cross national boundaries. I quoted blank 2005, in the, in the lives of migrants, transnational and national social spaces overlap and are influenced by political, social and cultural factors. The outlook of transnationalism has been used to sketch lineate and understand the various forms of transaction, social, economic, and political that happen across borders. One of my respondent tells me, home is not a destination, it's a journey and we travel through our language. Deleuze and Guattari are specifically interested in deterritorialization and re-territorialization as they relate to people who live in a language that is not their own. The process of transnationalism implies navigating between a sphere of different dichotomies, that is, the global and the local, the national and the international assimilation and distinctiveness. For the people in diaspora, another proposition is often under self-definition and negotiation, which is the concept of citizenship. Since the students in Gujarati classes are too young to understand the formal concept of citizenship, they're taught about plural identities where the teachers explain that they can be Indian and Portuguese simultaneously, and that it is not mandatory to live or to visit India or to, ident to identify as an Indian. By this, I can conclude that Gujarati classes have several dimensions and that they help in uh, formation and sustenance of diasporic identity among the Gujarati migrants in Lisbon, Portugal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think actually we're doing really well for time now. This is what happens when I get everybody talking too fast, sorry. Um, we are, I think now to see whether Dr. Monica Bishtaranjan is here. Are you here? No, ma'am, uh, I think I'm afraid she's not. Yes. She, she's not here. She's not here. Okay, so we'll just uh, move on. And our next paper, I, which I think may be our final paper, uh, according to my list, is Dr. Lakshmi, uh, AK, is what I have here. Um, Branches to Roots, Evolution of Indian Music. Oh no, I see two of them are run together. I beg your pardon. So we have two more papers. So I'm now looking for Ms. Shazia Khan, and that's Branches to Roots, Evolution of Indian Music in the Diaspora. Is Ms. Khan here? Yes, I am. Uh, am oh, I lovely. open? Uh, yes, if you could make sure we can see you as well. Um, actually, I'm facing some technical problems, so I don't think don't so. Don't worry. Okay. Thank you so much for giving me this time, and uh, I would like to finish up uh, in given time. So uh, I'm Shazia Khan and today I'm presenting a paper. Uh, the title of the paper is Branches to Roots, Evolution of Indian Music in the Diaspora. Identity formation among immigrants is a continual 
phenomena occurring in debates all over the world on issues related to migration, integration, and social solidarity. The research on ethnic identity formation focuses on a pertinent question about how the immigrant and diasporic communities access to their homeland culture despite living transnationally away from the regional homeland and maintain social cohesion and solidarity within the community that help them to that help them to form a distinct ethnic identity it is believed that multicultural a multicultural society thrives only if its members have access to their cultural heritage and collectively it does not lead to oppositional attitude to others andrew haywood uh, talks about two forms of multiculturalism and i quote uh, descriptive that refers to cultural diversity arising from the existence within a society already practicing a distinct sense of collective identity. And the second is normative, which represents or endorses communal diversity. In other words, rec recognizing, celebrating, and respecting the difference. This paper focuses on uh, a particular aspect of identity formation in diaspora through practicing music, which is more blended and is intercultural in nature. Music is an art and not a, a phenomena. It penetrates our lives and is directly and is and indirectly related to human minds, lifestyle and culture, helps us understand form, maintain social groups and engagement and emotional communication. Therefore, it is, uh, it is right to call music a social entity. Each culture, generation and even communities practice their own kind of music, but when time and space enters and collides with it, music changes its characteristics. In India, music is an essential part of every celebration, festivity and even rituals and plays a key role in many people's lives, shaping communities across the country, enriching and endorsing their own cultural traits. In diaspora, music has been acting as a unifying agent, semiotically conjuring the spirits of homeland through musical sounds. Moreover, providing a means of diasporic communication between unfamiliar diasporic communities, simultaneously empowering the uniqueness of cultural space and providing a voice for the marginalized one in the host land. Interculturalism and music are like companions in diaspora having individual purposes, yet combinedly developing a space for people from different races, communities, and religion to connect and create something new that goes beyond the definition of ordinary. With technological advancements in music sector and interculturalism paving paths for different performing arts to bloom and glow, grow larger every day. It enables us to connect with each other in peace and harmony uh, and uh, discarding the feeling of a feeling of otherness with the help of this paper i've tried and explore the ways in which hindustani music uh, which is the uh, music of uh, north india uh, evolved in intercultural setting and is uh, and its acceptability by the global audiences but before i move further with my paper and uh, and the study i would like to mention about the research methodologies that i have employed during my during my research uh, i've employed qualitative research methods methods to draw finding uh, findings and for the current study uh, i've interviewed uh, and uh, i've used interpretive observation case studies and a uh, uh, few of the research methods, uh, these are the few uh, research methods that helped me to fulfill the objective of this study. I would also like to mention that uh, uh, the inspiration to conduct this study has been drawn from Gaitra Bahadur's Kuli Woman and uh, Peggy Mohan's Jahajan. The modern concept of diaspora is understood as a social form of consciousness and as a mode of cultural production, which is different than its historical definition. Werterweg described it as diasporic situation established on feelings, consciousness, memory, and mythology, one that narrates and gives meaning to a particular group identity. The traditional meaning of diaspora centers around creating boundaries and focuses on roots of homeland and home, whereas postmodern diaspora Diaspora concepts promote homogeneity and heterogeneity confronted by the members of diasporic communities, where a diasporic identity is only one of the many identities a person encompasses and can navigate between different culture, cultural claims and negotiate their identity in relation to different contexts and culture. 
in such situations homeland becomes a static place which immigrant may invent symbolically politically e economically and in this particular case culturally it is difficult to disassociate disassociate the element of uh, tradition from community unions as it involves features such as myths and divinity in diaspora music served as a space and practice that binds binds group member group members together enabling them uh, understand themselves and gives them a sense of belonging in the caribbean people of indian origin uses their music as a symbolic identifier of social groups expressing and maintaining pre-existing identities with globalization hybridity kept penetrating and uh, cultural identity and it nearly became impossible to practice a fixed culture because people now respond to hybridity and with music it is not so different now music has given a window for expression of identity meanwhile it facilitates social transformation it is transcending people emotionally forming a link to old culture in new settings girmitia music is a byproduct of colonization and uh, globalization that has been celebrating dancing and singing over 150 years now chutney in particular is a name given to one of the styles of music that bloomed in the caribbean waters but had in hindustani roots and is very popular in trinidad tobago guyana suriname jamaica fiji mauritius and even in south africa it is a mixture of bhojpuri and local hindustani music brewed under the caribbean carnival influence accompanied by harmonium dholak and dhantal in the beginning it was religious in nature and was meant for wedding rituals and temples it was more about entertainment and social gatherings mostly sung by females later on several sub genres emerged out of it birth of chutney acted like a stamp of affirmation of indian identity among the caribbean society by staging their own style of carnival artists like ramde chato and dropadi introduced religious songs with uh, strong beats coupled with their own creolized form form of hindi later on artists like sundar popo and dropadi ramgunai introduced a soca mixed chutney to the audience of the caribbean which was more groovy in nature and bolder in lyrics chutney soca features uh, mostly women on stage uh, uh, or uh, in lyrics where one can easily see the heavy influence of westernization along with carnival ethos hybrid vocabulary alcohol and hedonism on the lives of uh, lives and identities of the second and third generation uh, east indians while they acknowledge their links to their past soon a uh, calypsonian element took over and slowly bhojpuri which used to be the central theme was replaced by trinidadian english i observe that there has been a rapid change uh, that took place during the evolution of this particular genre all in order to gain a mass acceptance artists like ras shauti and uh, ravi b introduced remixing of hindi film songs with calypso beats and popularized their own kind of chutney soca that went on to become an essential element of carnival celebration for which the caribbean society is well known for the loud beats of chutney even penetrated the minds of indian audience when in 2012 sneha khanwalkar uh, introduced it in one of the most acclaimed hindi feature film gangs of wasepur o womania and i am a hunter are the two songs that not only broke all the records but also attracted millions of audience to this never seen before music style it was for the first time when chutney as a genre was introduced to the layman of the country it will not be wrong to call chutney an expression for adaptation and sustainability it rebuilt indian claims on the uh, caribbean culture and even when it started losing its distinctiveness it still helped people of indian origin in the caribbean to keep the sense of indianism alive where one section of the caribbean society was grooving over high bpm music eulogizing festivity another sect of the society made it sure that the real form of hindustani music that their ancestors backpacked along with them while crossing kala pani stayed alive and untouched tan singing is a form of singing also evolved from indian folk and classical genre that has uh, that has a distinct creole influence over it 
and it also uh, it also is about festivity and religious ceremonies and most importantly it it uh, it it celebrates the hindu culture in foreign land one can easily observe several uh, mood oriented perf performances and Trinida trinidadians and surinamese celebrating phagwa shivratri diwali and cherishing hindi folk music Raj Mohan, artist of our age, who has been composing and performing some breathtaking Baithak Geet and Ghazal Numa songs, eulogizing Girmitya theme, paying tribute to preservation of indentured culture while celebrating 140 years of Sarnami. His contribution towards narration of Girmitya tales through music has given Sarnami Bhojpuri a platform to popularize the language, also oral literature and music culture. To conclude, I would like to say that the evolution of Indian music in the diaspora is a complicated tale of fusion and contradictions, illustrating how popular music can destabilize the notion of originality, authenticity, and purity in favor of creativity through continuous remixing and recycling musical knowledge. Music practice in diaspora can be understood as strengthening agent towards a community or an individual identity. Chutney has acted as a vehicle of adaptation, a mode of accommodation and assimilation, where on one hand, it strengthened the Indian claim over the Caribbean culture while, lo while losing its originality, yet keeping the sense of Indianism alive in the land, far from home, tradition and culture. Thank you so much. That was my time. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, that was really very interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to move on to our final paper, I believe, which is The Migrant Writer as a Global Citizen, Integration and Naturalization in Select Diasporic Literature with uh, Dr. Lush Lakshmi uh, AK, which is what I have here. I believe the AK isn't. I can't see you. Are you here? Dr. Lakshmi? No, ma'am. No? Okay. Well, in which case... Lakshmi um, is not here. She's not here either. All right. Um, so we have one more. Uh, I have I have something here called myriad aspects of the Indian diaspora, but I don't have a name. Is that is there somebody waiting to speak? Neelam Mittal. Neelam Mittal. She is Neelam Mittal. Myriad aspects oh. of Indian. Diaspora. Okay, lovely. So if if Neelam Mittal would like to speak, it's your turn. She's here, but I can see her. I can see her name. Ma'am, I'm here. Hello, ma'am. Oh, Hello, ma'am. Right. I'll just unmute and yes. I thought I thought there's another person before me that is why I was waiting. Yeah, no, don't worry, there was, but they, they're not here. So All it's right. over to you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, definitely. Yes, ma'am. I'll just begin. Don't uh, worry, just take your time. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, actually, I have uh, just, uh, you know, during the day, I changed the title of the paper, although the focus is going to be something very similar. Uh, the, now the title goes, Diaspora, colon, Debates, Fallouts, Discursive Variants. That is the title of the paper. Although, this, just the focus has shifted a bit, otherwise, the contents are going to be somewhat more or less similar. So, should I start, Ma'am, with your kind permission? Yes, Ma'am, please. Uh, what constitutes the diaspora? Early migrants who were the forced migrants versus the current contemporary migrations, if you look at the Indian context, when the current migrants migrate, and when I'm talking about the contemporary migrants, that is, they migrate with an informed choice. So the two kinds of migrations are very different from each other. Now, what are the problematics in an unambiguous definition of the diaspora. Let us look at few instances. For instance, Shashi Tharoor, the Indian writer, the Indian diasporic writer, we call him diasporic writer. Uh, he's a student, he was a student for a few years, okay? And uh, he was a few so a student in TUFTS University, that is uh, in the US, and he did his MA and PhD from there. And he did not intend to settle in that country, okay? However, he is included in the diaspora list uh, although he decides to return to India and he's, he's, set, he's come back to India, he's settled in India now. So that is a problematic area, number one. Number two, second point is that yearning to come back to the homeland 
was considered essential for the diaspora. For example, only if there is a sense of nostalgia for the homeland and a desire to return to the homeland, only then it was understood as uh, pertaining to the category of the diaspora. But no, there are many shades of gray regarding this as well, because the modern diaspora does not necessarily, necessarily undergo this um, this uh, uh, incumbent need or that, that intense desire to return back to the homeland. Number three. Now, in the present scenario, the world is becoming multicultural, global. So, we have kids of multicultural parentage. Where do they fall? What kind of nostalgia is expected of them? Another problematic area. There's a rehash at the diasporic experience in the contemporary world as not just displacement or rootedness, but also euphoria, hope, belonging, that sense of belongingness to the host country. There's not just yearning for the homeland, rather there is a sense of creation of a new home away from home. Plus, now we have multiple displacements and it is difficult to club it under the ambit of conventional parlance of rootedness, oblique nostalgia. Now, if I look at a critic called Avtar Bra, he says that diasporic embodies the subtext of home, which means that the native country, there is the concept of the native country as home versus the host country as the second home. I would like to give an example of Uma Parmeswaran, the Indian diasporic writer, who feels equally comfortable in both the homes, whether it is in India, so that is her, that was her birthplace, or that she is settled in Canada. Another, con another contentious area is diaspora within a nation. For instance, uh, there are migrations within the country. For instance, India being a huge country, a large country, there are migrations from small villages to big cities. So there is there can be a migration from a village to a metropolis like Delhi. And there can also be a migration from a metropolis like Delhi to a world metropolis like the US. Now, the whole point is that the former, that is the migration from a small village to a big city, okay, versus the migration from Delhi as the metropolis, the national metropolis to the world metropolis, that is the US. What is the difference between the two? The difference is that the former can have a larger bearing on the displaced sensibility than the latter. Now, Uh, there is another important thing. The point is about the early diaspora and the later diaspora, the indentured laborers and the fossilized responses of those indentured laborers, for example, in the Caribbean versus the new diaspora uh, who don't have as much of the experiences of the yearning and the angst and the trauma and the memory. Okay, these things are not so intense in the contemporary diaspora, the modern diaspora. The experience is more now, the presently, the experience is more in terms of a gain rather than a loss. There's euphoria of straddling the new world with growing prosperity. Their experience undergoes a sea change so that looking at it through the blinkered eyes of rootlessness and nostalgia and loss needs to be modified. Another important factor is the factor of class. So that a family at the top of an MNC ladder in the US, an Indian family I'm talking about, at the top of the MNC ladder in the US, visiting India n number of times without any constraints and having, you know, and, and I'm talking about these dirt rich, you know, diasporic entities, they have a different experience of the diaspora completely from the diaspora who would be like, you know, constrained by time, constrained by money and so many things. Right, and, and who are under compulsion to stay in the host country. Right? Another important point that the yearning and memory takes a backseat when traveling between one country and the other is so very comfortable. So that is there, is the yearning so intense? Absolutely not. Then there are the disadvantaged genders in India may look for freedom in countries which are open to sexual dissidents. Now that much also, that this factor also applies to I'm talking about the Indian context because the, the kind of freedom that they don't enjoy here, they can find, you know, in other places. It is necessary to look at these nuances within literature too. Second generation, another, another important aspect is that the second generation diaspora live or have different kinds of experiences. They live double lives. 
the home culture and the outside the home culture. So these double lives. So what when they step out of the home, is a different socio-cultural uh, scenario, different ethics, different ethos that they have to attest to. Whereas when they're inside the house, okay, inside the home, the second generation, they see a different atmosphere altogether. So the experience of each individual is very different. So it is very subjective, varying from person to person. Now, the world statistical data shows that 99% of the diasporas never return to the homeland. True. And on one level, yes, yet they keep returning to the homeland in reiterative pattern of discomfort and fascination with the host country. So there is a kind of a dual impulse. There's discomfort in the host country as at the same time, there's a fascination with all the comfort and all the, you know, all the uh, commodities that they enjoy in the host country. There's a, also a persistent nostalgia for the homeland in spite of saying that they don't feel nostalgic, there will be a corner of their mind which will say that yes, they are feeling nostalgic. Now we are talking about this novel. I'm thinking of a novel called The Namesake. Uh, in this novel, uh, Ashima, Ashima, who is the central character, who is the mother of you know uh, the uh, two kids, and uh, she is uh, Bengali who is a uh, migrant to uh, the states from Calcutta. Ashima decides to return to Calcutta, and Mishra, Vijay Mishra, is a critic. He calls the diaspora as a revenant that returns and haunts. Vijay Mishra says that the diaspora is a revenant that returns and Haunts. So, you know, this kind of thing, this discomfort will remain, whatever it is. The beginning of the novel presents Ashima as a frail, highly protected woman, dependent on her husband, deeply entrenched in her Bengali culture, restricted to addressing her husband with the Indian interrogative, are you listening to me? Happily ensconced in her Murshidabad silk sari, a woman who spends the night away from uh, sorry, a woman who spends the night away from, never spends the night away from her husband or her family. And for the first time in the US hospital, when she's about to deliver the child, this is the first time that she has to stay away from her family. And at that point of time, she feels the misery and the weight of the separation from her kith and kin. At one point, she declares to her husband, Ashok, that enough was enough, that she could not bear it anymore, that she wanted to go back to Calcutta. Time passes. Ashima learns to adjust, to adapt. She learns, she reaches a stage when having lost her husband, okay, in the, in the course of the novel, she loses her husband. She learns to live independently, working in a library, articulating her new identity. And this is where she says, this is my home, this land where I lost my husband. In spite of this declaration, Ashima, chooses to return to Calcutta at the end of the novel. She plans to go back home and stays with her brother for six months with no other plans or certainty about the future. Returning an, on an American passport with an American security card, she knows she will miss her job in the library and, Cal and that Calcutta, which was once home, is now in its own way foreign. So this concept of what is foreign and what is your own homeland and creation of a new homeland away from home, the, the whole point is that these categories keep on shifting. There is This is a mercurial kind of a um, psychological state where human being, and as said, that these are all subjective experiences. So Ashima takes it this way. Vijay Mishra explicates Ashima's condition with a citation from Adip Khan's 1994 book, Seasonal Adjustments. And this is what he says. The womb was there all right, except I could not fit into it anymore. Meaning for Ashima, the womb that is Calcutta as the birthplace, as her own, it was very much there, but Ashima could not fit into it anymore because she had changed. So this is the condition of hybridity that Ashima is uh, living in at this point of time. I would like to make a few more, a few more, uh, obviously a number of observations, and then I have to be selective in what I say. Um, repression of, yes, the repercussion of the migration can be layered. What are the various levels? One is the individual level, the other is the cultural level, another is the economic level. At the individual level, the impact on the diasporic entity constitutes culture shock. Culture shock, the, that the discomfort of alienation in the host country, a fissured human ex existence lived with a palpable splintering of connection with the homeland. 
now relegated to the liminal zone of imaginary homeland. That is the term that Rushdie uses. He calls it imaginary homeland because having receded from that past, it is difficult to connect with that past in the same way. Then there is the two-way contrapuntal rhythm between an intense longing and nostalgia for the lost homeland and a pragmatic take on getting assimilated into the mainstream culture of the host country as a sheer impulse for survival. Culture and economic repercussions are intertwined with each other. Diasporic cultures are understood as constituting valuable networks of intellectual, cultural, and educational exchange. The recent trend in cultural exchange where students get an opportunity to know and get to live Sorry, sorry uh, to know and get live experience of what other cultures connote and purport is sorry in all their myriad ramifications. So that is the thing that we have in India and many parts of the world where students get an opportunity to get into this program of cultural exchange and they can go to the to migrate to they can go and spend some time in another country and get to know their culture and same thing happens with the students of the other countries. The purpose is to understand each other's value system, cultural and ethical knowledge systems and the hermeneutical understanding of life itself. The purpose is to catch them young so that as students, they learn to find their feet with the rest of humanity. I'm using Clifford Geert's phrase here. We should be able to find our feet with the rest of humanity so that we can understand them and we are able to transcend our own ethnocentric identities, our own you know, insular identities. The cultural anthropologist talks about coming to terms with an alien culture, alien context, and an alien people, so that it leads to the transcendence of one's narrow ethnocentric identity and cultural stereotyping. Economic, economic impact is equally momentous. In today's world of multinational companies, the intercultural exchange is essential. In a globalized world, insularity is not feasible. Clifford Gates talks about ethnic diversity and its implications in the modern world, the indispensably interconnected cultures and peoples. Interactive workplaces and work cultures endorse these interconnective value systems. I would like to make one or two more observations. Let's have a look at Jhumpaleri, Jhumpaleri's novel called The Namesake. Jhumpaleri is an Indian expatriate writer. She was born in London to Indian parents. Her parents moved to the US when she was three years old. The double displacement of the parents from the homeland and Larry's double displacement from her roots has significant implications for the writer of the Indian diaspora. Having receded from their past and their roots, their conceptualization, contextualization and interpretation of the past and the homeland is always under interrogation. Its very similitude remains under a shadow of doubt. That is where Rashti which these comments gains pertinence. It may be that writers in my position, exiles or emigrants or expatriates are haunted by some sense of loss, some urge to reclaim, to look back, even at the risk of being mutilated into pillars of salt. But when we do look back, we do, we must do in the knowledge, which gives rise to profound uncertainties that our physical alienation from India almost inevitably means that we will not be capable of reclaiming precisely the thing that was lost, that we will, in short, create fictions, not actual cities or villages, but invisible ones, imaginary homelands, India's of the mind, that is Rashti. True, chronotopically distanced from the homeland, the actual topical, historical, and cultural facets of the homeland present themselves as enmeshed in an ever-receding elusive, evanescent arena. The past eludes and deludes, fascinates and invites with a persistent danger of falling into an idealistic recreation of a not so ideal past. The point finds apt elucidation and substantiation in the term diasporic imaginary, as employed by Vijay Mishra, a distant past receding into that liminal space between the real versus the surreal, the immediate and the palpable, versus the imagined and the recession into the half-recovered, half-remembered, partially formulated past, reinventing it perpetually through remembrance and exercise of imagination and the concomitant act of wish fulfillment. I would like to end here, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, well, my goodness, we've had such wonderful papers and we actually do have about 15 minutes now for 
conversation. Um, there's 21 of us in the room, so there's not too many of us. Just to remind you, um, you know, we've heard about uh, Jhumpa Lahiri a couple of times. Um, we've heard about Tibetan refugees in India and their particular status. And I guess one of my questions around that would be, given that one of the reasons the Tibetan refugees leave, leave China in the first place is because of the suppression of culture and particularly religious culture, um, you know, is that a quite a strong factor in their, um, their, their capacity and their resilience in, in, in maintaining culture? Is that a, the, the aim of, of diaspora in their case, for instance? Um, we've had a, a wonderful call to remember Africa within, I'm um, sorry, my, my language is very bad, but Africans in India and, um, and why um, and how you might want to re-see their presence, their, their thousand year presence here or there. Um, we've, we, we, there's a couple of papers we didn't actually hear because people weren't here, but we heard about cultural codes in Lisbon and the importance of Gujarati. And we've heard about music and chutney music, which um, I know and love. And uh, we've also just heard about the um, the diasporic literature. And and it was just so lovely to hear you quote Vijay Mishra, who used to be a colleague of mine in Western Australia, and uh, who I was talking to only a few weeks ago. So great to hear his name pop up. Anyway, um, we now have uh, we have fifteen minutes. So if anybody wants to um, ask a question, perhaps just put your name in the chat and um, you can be unmuted and ask your question. And also, of course, if the speakers want to ask questions of each other, that's also completely fine, whatever you would like to do. Everyone's very quiet. Um, okay, well, I'm going to ask a question then to get things going. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more, actually, about um, African cultures in in India, and and to to ask if there are any, um, you know, if there are, if you are any particular kind of points of connection that have become either embedded or or perhaps disappeared. People are so used to them that people no longer recognise them as coming from um, African relations and then we'll go on to uh, Dr. Nea Bothra who has a, a comment. So this one's for Dr. Manish. Yeah, uh, yes, I'm listening to you. Yes, I just wondered, well, um, I did have a question, but I've, I've seen that um, Dr. Nea Bothra has a, has a question and he's, yeah. hasn't spoke, or she hasn't spoken yet, but could you unmute and, I can't unmute you, but I think. I think control A. Uh, um. Dr. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'm here. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation. The group of uh, research scholars and the professors, the diversified experiences that we got to hear here today. I just have a slight observation. Uh, there was a research paper wherein some uh, uh, research uh, was did. All right. So I just have a discuss. Uh, widely about several picturization of photo gallery was being uh, shared with us. That was uh, way back in 2010. So, sir, I would like you, if you can share some of your recent pictures, if you could collect any, uh, because yes, you have uh, tried to make a connect with the people uh, living in India and a huge population is today Indian. And it's been a long time that they are uh, in India, however, but their initial phase came as maybe they came to India as slaves. Now they are majorly integral part of our country. And one thing more, some economic framework I also wanted to discuss. Like a lot of economic activities they are first in India, the people who are residing in India. Oh, thank you. It's a very pertinent question because I missed that slide somehow. So uh, it's very good 
can i present my screen so i can um, uh, like uh, i can uh, show some my current pictures and some my current data so yes 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 yes, yes i'm ready with because somehow uh, i didn't yes this is my recent uh, uh, journey to the ahmedabad uh, before the covid because i was planning to uh, came uh, go to uh, uh, ahmedabad again and again but uh, it was the covid era covid time so i didn't do this but uh, in december january i went to um, ahmedabad and i interacted i i i suppose that i uh, showed these uh, slides but uh, it's okay so uh, i interacted with the leaders of that community uh, a uh, a uh, very old uh, person uh, she uh, she went to here and there to perform their uh, dances and some of the uh, some of uh, organizers attached with the some of organization also and she came to delhi and uh, and uh, will uh, will get together somehow but this is my uh, uh, picture which i took uh, during my uh, ahmedabad stay uh, and the next uh, uh, yes uh, and this is the cities uh, present cities um, who are living uh, in uh, pathar kuwa basically this whole uh, whole research my whole research is based on the pathar kuwa and my uh, young researchers they they more specified about the concept and uh, diaspora concept translation concept but i i uh, i um, i uh, do some uh, res- uh, some uh, field work to uh, to get some Uh, idea some real field ground idea so this is what i'm trying to say this is the picture where um, i was uh, when pathar kuwa and i interact with and this this guy uh, dr bhote this guy who performed uh, this dance to almost 10 uh, countries outside india but still they are living in very um, uh, very in poor condition in pathar kuwa and this is the young uh, young students and they are uh, they are learning english hindi and as well as gujarati and look like uh, 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 look like somehow the feature of uh, distinct feature of uh, afro indians okay but uh, 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 they are in hindi uh, very well english very well so i interacted uh, them to also okay and this is the uh, this is the majar uh, i mai majar or baba gur majar they perform their rituals there and this is the uh, street where they are living so these are the some uh, pictures i took there and uh, based on these pictures these interviews uh, i came to conclusion which i already reiterate um, during my presentation and this is the area sabarmati river and this is these are just like in delhi because i'm residing in delhi so old delhi and new delhi this is the area um, uh, where they are residing now right now pathar kuwa this is called the old uh, hyderabad a uh, whole old ahmedabad why i am um, uh, uh, very much like um, uh, intermingled with hyderabad and ahmedabad because one of my co panelist from hyderabad in hyderabad there was the ac guard area african cavalry guard area and i used to go there and and uh, study uh, um, about their uh, day to day life and social and economic structure and and this is the most uh, important uh, mosque in ahmedabad and called siddi sayed mosque and uh, and this is important that uh, once upon it uh, once uh, the iit ahmedabad emblem depicts uh, from this um, uh, this uh, mosque so jali what is called jali these are the some pictures uh, right now i'm having so many uh, pictures but uh, right now it is not available these are the pictures which i um, i want to show to you and thank you very much for this question and about your economic um, activities i mentioned earlier that the uh, they are doing uh, 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 not so called white collar jobs they are doing drivers mechanics security guards watchmen and the some computer trainers and the first time uh, i am in the pathar kuwa few people are uh, Uh, are doing engineering only two or three and one uh, the cd baby cd baby used to go to the uh, usa also but usa is not like the uh, they are become uh, modern and so called but out of 500 uh, cds living there they are not in the good position economically socially they accepted the, the culture which we are living and uh, and but one thing
again, they are not discriminated because not only the Africans, uh, uh, the so many people in so many popular, the population of India as living uh, so, uh, in uh, not very good condition in. So this is not discrimination. This is then part and parcel of uh, um, uh, somehow uh, 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 it's not called culture, somehow Indian practices. So I'm not uh, uh, getting this. They are not discriminated, but yes, they are living in a very poor condition in the Patharku and we need uh, 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 we need some uh, reforms. We need some uh, actual work on ground. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. well, do we have another question? We've got, we've got time for one more question if anyone is burning to ask something. Your speakers are all here, ready to answer you. <coughs> no. Well, I think in which case I will say thank you very much to everybody who's been here in the room today. Um, thank you to, your, to the speakers, all of whom who've presented such wonderful and fascinating work. Um, thank you again. To, for organizing this conference and for keeping us all in contact with one another in what is a very hard time for so many people. I hope you all stay safe. I hope everyone watching on Facebook is safe and, uh, and have a very good rest of your days. Thank you so much. Thank you. On behalf Thank of you. the organizers, uh, GRMDT, MFA, CISAN, I like to thank uh, Professor Stickney Donald for uh, sharing such a wonderful session, and I also like to thank all the presenters for presenting their work and sharing their valuable findings, as well as reporters and uh, the participants for making this event one of the excellent event of this uh, seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you all, and be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.